When I was just little, my parents decided that living together under the same roof wasn't their cup of tea anymore. It's like, imagine you're trying to fit two puzzle pieces together, but no matter how you twist or turn them, they just don't click. That's what happened with my mom and dad. They were like two pieces from completely different puzzles. They used to argue a ton about big stuff and even silly small stuff. It was pretty clear they were on different paths in life, liking different things and wanting different stuff. They both realized this wasn't just a rough patch. It was how things were going to be. So they both agreed it was best to not be a couple anymore. Instead of turning it into a huge drama scene, like something you'd see on a TV show where everyone's yelling in court, they kept it chill. They talked it out and made decisions without making everything messier. My dad's job was the kind where he was hardly ever home, always hopping on planes to different places. So it made sense for me to stick with my mom. My dad agreed to help out by sending money every month so we could take care of all the things I needed. I was too young to really understand any of this back then. It was like a movie plot I wasn't quite getting. Then on my 12th birthday, curiosity got the better of me. It was like this nagging question in my video game of life, and I just had to ask my mom, why can't we all be like those TV families that stick together? My mom, she didn't try to make it sound less bad or dance around the topic. She gave it to me straight. The whole story, no filters. I won't lie. It felt like someone popped my favorite balloon. It was a tough pill to swallow, realizing that my family wasn't going to be one of those happily ever after stories. Fast forward to me at 15. I've had some time to process, to understand, and sort of accept my family's unique setup. It's not perfect, but it's mine, you know? But then, plot twist. My mom introduces me to Ted. She's been secretly dating him, and they're super serious about each other. So serious, in fact, they've decided to get hitched. I met Ted a couple of months ago, but I only recently found out they've been a thing for a whole year. It's like suddenly finding out there's a new character added to your favorite TV show out of the blue. So, here's the deal. The main reason my mom decided it was time for me to meet Ted wasn't just for the sake of introductions. They had this big plan in mind, moving in together. My mom thought it'd be cool for me to have some time to chill and get to know Ted before all our lives got mashed up into one household. Honestly, Ted's not a bad guy. He's actually kind of fun to hang out with at times and seems to know where the line is. He's pretty good about not stepping into my space like he's trying to be my new dad, which I really respect. He gets that I'm not looking for a replacement dad, and I appreciate that about him. But here's where it gets sticky. Ted's son, Alex. I just started high school, which is a big deal on its own, but I also switched to a new school. And guess who's also roaming the halls of my new high school? Alex. Yeah, Ted's kid. Even though we know who each other are, it's like we're strangers once we step onto school grounds. I gave it a shot, tried to chat him up a few times when we first bumped into each other, but he wasn't having any of it. Straight up ignored me or brushed me off. And it's not just me he's giving the cold shoulder. He doesn't seem to be a fan of my mom, either. I get the vibe that he's not okay with his dad dating again, especially since his dad was a widow. Maybe he feels like my mom is trying to take his own mom's place, which is a tough pill to swallow for anyone. So, he just keeps his distance from both of us, all the time. And that really bugs me. It's even worse seeing my mom trying so hard to make him like her, bending over backward to get his approval. Every Sunday night, we all sit down together for dinner. It's like our thing, a way to catch up and just be a family, you know? This particular Sunday, things took an unexpected turn. Out of the blue, Alex drops this bombshell. He says he can't move in with us, with his dad and my mom and me. My mom, trying to be helpful, asks him why. Our place is bigger, cozier, and it's even closer to school. It seemed like a no-brainer to us, but Alex, he's got this whole other side to him we hadn't really seen before. He's super passionate about his art. He's in his last year of high school, and he's dead serious about making it into a prestigious art school. He explains that his thing is painting, like actual physical painting, not just the digital stuff that's all the rage these days. To chase this dream, he needs a dedicated space where he can dive into his work, a place to build a portfolio that could open doors for him at art schools. Back at his place, he's turned their garage into his personal art studio. It's perfect because it's just him and his dad, and they only have one car that parks in the driveway. But if he moves into our house, he wouldn't have a spot like that. He'd lose his studio his sanctuary where he can create and work on his art for hours on end. Especially now, in his crucial final year, when he can't just leave his projects at school since he needs to put in extra time at home. That's when my mom, bless her heart, trying to solve problems like she always does, offers up what she thinks is the perfect solution. She suggests that Alex could take over my room to use as his studio. And, as if it's the most obvious solution in the world, she says I'd be totally cool with moving out of my room for this. I was floored. Completely taken aback. The idea that I would just hand over my personal space where I have all my stuff, 
where I relax and have my moments of peace, for it to become someone else's art studio. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I felt overlooked and honestly really hurt by her suggestion. You might be wondering, why on earth should I give up my room? Especially for someone who hasn't exactly been Mr. Friendly to us, right? And it's a fair question. Why does Alex get the luxury of having not just a bedroom, but also a studio for his art, while I'm expected to just hand over my space and get nothing in return? The moment my mom suggested this, I knew I had to speak up. I didn't hold back and made sure to express how much I disliked the idea. But my mom, in her typical let's keep the peace manner, basically told me to zip it for the moment, promising we'd sort out my concerns later. Come the next morning, I was all geared up for a serious chat with my mom. I was ready to lay it all out crystal clear that giving up my room was off the table. But before I could really get into it, my mom hit me with the be helpful and learn to compromise talk. She explained that it's not forever, just a few months until Alex heads off to college, which would be in about eight to nine months. And then, as if she'd just solved the world hunger crisis, she suggests I could move into her private office. She even promised to put a bed in there for me. But here's the thing. Being told to sleep in an office while thinking of the living room and kitchen as some sort of extended personal space just didn't cut it for me. It felt like a slap in the face. Why should my life get turned upside down for nearly a year? And all for a guy who clearly doesn't even want to be part of our family. It just didn't seem fair or right, and I was deeply hurt by the whole situation. It felt like my own mom was prioritizing Alex's needs and wants over mine, which was just a lot to process. Okay, so here's the deal. After all the drama about giving up my room for Alex, I figured I needed some backup. And who better to call for backup than my dad, right? Since he's still involved paying child support and all, I thought he'd definitely want to know what's going down at my mom's place. Plus, I had this gut feeling he'd be on my side once he heard the whole story. So, I went ahead and told him everything. About how my mom wanted me to give up my room for Alex, and how I was supposed to crash in her office instead. Just like I expected, my dad was like, No way, this isn't happening to my kid. He promised he'd have a chat with my mom to sort things out, make her see sense, and fix my situation. Now, fast forward a few days. I'm walking back home from school, totally unaware of the storm brewing at home. The moment I step in, I can tell something's off. My mom's there, and man, is she fuming. It's like I walked straight into a hurricane. The second she sees me, it's game on. She blasts me for going behind her back and telling my dad about what was happening. She accused me of making it sound like I was living some nightmare at her house, which was totally not what I was trying to do. My mom was super upset, saying she's always made sure I had whatever I needed, and this was the first time she was asking for a little flexibility for me, for her sake. It felt like she was trying to guilt trip me, making it seem like I was the bad guy for not wanting to give up my room and for involving my dad. It was a really tough spot to be in. I mean, I just wanted my dad to help make things right, not start World War III at home. But there I was, stuck in the middle of this massive argument, feeling like everything was somehow my fault. So after my mom went off on me for telling my dad about the room situation, she dropped another huge piece of news. She said that my dad didn't just talk to her about it, he actually threatened to take legal action to make sure I was being treated right, which includes having my own room. Hearing that made me freak out a bit. I wasn't expecting things to escalate to this level. I mean, legal action sounds super serious and the thought of it scared me. My mom seemed really upset about it too, like she felt I'd gone behind her back and betrayed her by bringing my dad into this. Her reaction was so intense and angry that I didn't even know what to say. I just ran to my room, feeling overwhelmed and upset, and I've been pretty much crying since then. I want to make it clear. I don't hate my mom. Not at all. But what she said really, really hurt. It feels like she's trying so hard to make sure Alex, her stepson, feels welcome and happy that she's willing to turn my life upside down to do it. And it's like I'm just being dragged into this mess she's creating, without really considering how it affects me. Now I'm stuck feeling super confused about what's right or wrong in this situation. Part of me feels guilty for even feeling upset about this. I start wondering if I'm just being too difficult or demanding, like I'm making a big deal out of nothing. Am I the one at fault here for not wanting to give up my room and for telling my dad about what's going on? Am I just being a high-maintenance girl who can't help her mom out during a tough time? But then, another part of me thinks that it's not wrong to want to have my own space, especially in my own home. It's a lot to process and I'm trying to figure out if standing up for myself makes me the bad guy in this story. Update 1. So a few weeks back, I shared with you all about this huge change happening in my house. My mom decided that her stepson, Alex, needed my room more than I did. He needed it for his art stuff, turning it into his personal studio, which meant I had to move out of my own space. After talking to my mom and hearing how she felt, 
how she just needed some support and adjustments from my side, I felt really bad. It's like I was caught between wanting to stand up for myself and wanting to be there for my mom. So I decided to just go with it, even though it felt like swallowing a bitter pill. Living in my mom's office in the living room hasn't been easy. Imagine this. My kitchen table has turned into my new study area, the living room sofa is now my bed, and my mom's office is where I keep all my clothes. It's like my whole living situation got turned upside down. And let me tell you, I'm not loving it. It feels like I'm just trying to make do with what I've got, but it's far from ideal. Alex, on the other hand, seems to be having the time of his life, acting like he owns the place. And that's been rubbing me the wrong way. I've been trying to keep it together. Really, I have. But then, something as simple as ice cream became the last straw. I bought myself some ice cream, kind of as a little treat to help me deal with all this mess. And guess what? Alex ate it. All of it. That might sound small, but when you're already feeling low, it feels like a big deal. Right around then, my dad called. Hearing his voice, knowing he was out there and concerned, I just couldn't hold it in anymore. I broke down and cried over the phone, telling him everything. About the ice cream, sure, but really about how hard everything's been since I lost my room. It was like all the frustration, all the upset, just came pouring out after everything that had been going on. From losing my room to the ice cream incident, I ended up spilling my heart out to my dad over the phone. He could tell just how upset and hurt I was by all the changes and challenges I was facing. Hearing his daughter in such distress, my dad was clearly upset too. He reassured me in his dad-like way that I didn't have to worry, promising he'd handle everything. Honestly, I wasn't sure what he meant by taking care of everything, but I was too upset to think much about it. I just felt a bit relieved that he wanted to help. But what happened next was totally unexpected. The following day, a Child Protective Services, CPS worker, showed up at our door. It was like something out of a movie. I never imagined something like this would happen in my life. The CPS worker had a lot of questions for me, trying to understand my living situation. My mom was there too, and she was really cautious, not letting the worker inside because he didn't have a search warrant. But she did agree to let him talk to me outside. It was a serious and kind of scary conversation, with him asking about how I've been living and feeling. After the CPS worker left, the atmosphere at home was tense. My mom was visibly angry and wanted to know who had called CPS on us. It didn't take long for me to realize it must have been my dad who made the call, thinking it was the best way to help me. I told her as much, and that's when things got even more complicated. Now I'm really scared about what's going to happen next. My mom, in her anger, took away my phone and has pretty much cut me off from talking to anyone outside our home. I'm writing this using my school's computer because it's the only way I can reach out without her knowing. I haven't been able to call my dad or anyone else to talk about what happened or what I should do now. It's like I'm stuck in this really tough spot, and I don't know how to make things better or what's going to happen with our family after all this. Update 2. Remember the whole situation with the CPS worker showing up at my house? Well, things escalated pretty quickly from there. The same worker came back, but this time he wasn't alone. He had a warrant to check our house properly. Despite me insisting that I wasn't being mistreated, it seemed like my words weren't enough to convince them otherwise. To make matters even more intense, my dad showed up alongside them. He dropped this huge bombshell on me, saying that he's planning to legally adopt me, which meant I would have to move in with him. Honestly, I was just hoping he'd have a serious chat with my mom to sort things out, not take things to this extreme level. The idea of moving in with my dad is complicated. It's not that I don't want to be with him, but he's always on the move for work. I'd often have to stay at his place by myself, which isn't ideal, especially considering it's pretty far from my school. I've just kicked off my sophomore year, and the thought of switching schools mid-year freaks me out. By now, everyone's already found their cliques, and jumping into a new school would put me on the outside, making it tough to fit in. Plus, there's the whole issue with my classes. I might end up having to pick subjects that nobody wants because all the good ones are taken. So I made it clear to my dad that moving in with him just isn't an option for me. I tried to tell him I'm managing fine with the current setup, despite how it might look from the outside. But once CPS got involved, he said his hands were tied. There wasn't much he could do to reverse the process or change their minds. Now I'm stuck in this really stressful situation, hoping and praying that CPS doesn't decide to remove me from my current home. It feels like no matter what I say or do, the decision is out of my hands. And that's probably the scariest part of all this. Update 3. So after all the chaos and stress, there's finally a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. The whole situation with Child Protective Services, CPS, didn't turn out as bad as I feared. They checked everything out and decided that I wasn't being abused, which is a huge relief. Even better, 
my mom decided to let me move back into my old room. That felt like a big win. However, CPS had some concerns about whether I was in an emotionally stable environment, especially with all the changes happening at home because of my mom's new relationship with Ted. They thought all this might be messing with my head a bit. But after going through a psychological evaluation, my mom managed to prove that those worries were unfounded, and we won the case. I played my part by sticking up for my mom throughout this ordeal. I also had a heart-to-heart -heart with my dad. I told him that I felt he went way over the top by involving CPS without giving me a heads up first. All I really wanted was to get my room back, but things spiraled into something way bigger. Looking back, I feel pretty bad about how I reacted to everything. I even told my dad that he should take what I say with a grain of salt next time, thinking I might be blowing things out of proportion. I've come to realize that a lot of the drama that unfolded was sparked by my actions and reactions. So I apologized to my mom and Ted for all the stress and trouble I caused. Now, with everything settling down, I'm left feeling super embarrassed about how everything went down. It's like I wish I could just hide away somewhere because of the guilt and shame I feel for stirring up so much trouble over what started as a personal issue. Update 4. Hey everyone, after the whirlwind of events that unfolded in the last few updates, I'm here to share some much-needed positive news. It's been a time of reflection, learning, and surprisingly, growth for me and my family. First off, I want to address the elephant in the room, my sudden move back into my old room. After the CPS investigation concluded, Mom and I had a long, heart-to-heart -heart conversation. It was emotional, raw, and honestly, something we've needed for a long time. I expressed how displaced I felt, not just physically without my room, but also emotionally, feeling like I was second to Ted and Alex in her life. Mom was incredibly understanding and apologetic. She admitted to getting caught up in trying to make her relationship work that she didn't see the toll it was taking on me. Ted, overhearing our conversation, chimed in too. He apologized for not realizing sooner the impact his and Alex's presence was having on me. It was a breakthrough moment for all of us. Alex and I, well, that's a different story. After avoiding each other for so long, we finally sat down together, just the two of us. It turns out he's been dealing with his own set of issues, grappling with the loss of his mother and the fear of being replaced or forgotten. Our talk wasn't magical, but it was a start. We've agreed to try and understand each other better, acknowledging it won't be easy but worth the attempt for our parents' sake. Dad, on the other hand, has been incredible through this ordeal. After the CPS scare, he realized, as did I, that we jumped too quickly into drastic measures. He's promised to be more involved, not just as a weekend dad, but a constant presence in my life. We've set up a schedule for me to stay with him during his non-travel weeks, which means I won't have to change schools or leave my friends behind. As for my relationship with my mom, it's stronger now. We've both made promises to communicate better and be more considerate of each other's feelings. She's even started involving me in decisions that affect the household including setting up a dedicated space for Alex to work on his art without infringing on my personal space. In a surprising turn of events, Alex and I are getting along better. We're not best friends, but there's a newfound respect between us. He's even shown me some of his art, and I have to admit, he's incredibly talented. Life is slowly getting back to normal, or rather, a new normal for us. It's not perfect, but it's ours, and there's a sense of peace and stability I haven't felt in a long time. I've learned a lot about myself through this process, about empathy, resilience, and the complex dynamics of blended families. I want to thank everyone for their support and advice during this tumultuous time. It's been a roller coaster of emotions, but I'm hopeful for what the future holds for us as a family. So here's to new beginnings, to understanding, forgiveness, and the complicated, beautiful mess that is family. Signing off with gratitude and a lot of hope, the girl who's learning to navigate her blended family. Now for the top comments. NTA, you're not the a-hole here for trying to stick up for what you should be provided as a teenager. If Alex's final year of high school is important enough for him to have a room of his own and an extra studio show, then your life is also important enough to have some privacy. And your mom is an a-hole who is sidetracking her own child in order to win over someone else's. NTA, although I do think that you sound a little entitled and bratty, I still believe that you have a right to have your own room, especially if that Alex guy is going to get two rooms. Story two. Hi, 44 female. I'm a stay-at-home mom to a one-and-a-half-year-old. My husband, 34, now works full-time, so I do the bulk of baby duty. Today we cooked on the grill, and the neighbors stopped by to watch some football. Hubby mentioned he wanted to go to the bar later with guys, so I asked him to watch the baby now so I could get my workout in for the day. He agreed, 
and asked me to put the baby down for a nap before I left. I head to the gym and decide to check the baby monitor. One of the Wi-Fi ones you can check from anywhere about 30 minutes into my workout. Sure enough, the baby is awake and crying. I figured dad will be up in a few minutes, so I turn it off and finish my sets. Five minutes later, I checked again. Baby is still crying. Dad is still not showing up. I tell myself to stop helicopter puttering and keep working out, but don't turn off the monitor. Five more minutes of crying goes by, so I text hubby and say, go get the baby. Been crying for a while now. Another five minutes goes by and nothing at this point. I give up on the workout and drive home. I get home. The baby is still crying and dad is with the neighbors in the backyard. I get the baby covered in snot and with a massively dirty diaper. Clean up the mess and head downstairs with baby. Hobbs responds to my text with Kay while I'm changing the diaper but never came upstairs. He comes inside, finally sees me with the baby, says I didn't have to rush home to take care of things and that I was being dramatic. I told him that it's ridiculous that 20 plus minutes went by before he even fought to check. He swears he just didn't hear the crying and gets the neighbors to say they couldn't hear it either. I told him he should have been paying attention to the monitor, not depending on hearing cries from upstairs, especially when he's in and out of the house and has music TV playing. He said I was an a-hole for calling him out for being a bad dad in front of those people and for checking up on him, especially because the baby was fine. He even did the whole, you're okay, aren't you? Baby? Crying for a little bit just makes you stronger. Talk to the kid, which was really directed at me. I thought I handled it calmly, considering the amount of time that elapsed. I also never said he was a bad dad, just that he wasn't paying attention when he needed to be. Am I the a-hole here? Now for the top comments. NTA, he was neglectful. Maybe you shouldn't have checked the monitor, but sure, glad you did. He didn't take caring for his own child very seriously. I'd be furious. And I think you're entitled to some anger. Maybe check out weaponized incompetence and see if it fits your husband. NTA. Your husband knows he messed up. That's why he's accusing you of calling him a bad dad when all you did was accurately describe what he did wrong. If what he did makes him look like a bad dad, then that's on him. And you are not obligated to make nice about it just because the neighbors are there. What you say to him is leaving your own child helplessly flailing around in their own shit while you hang out with your pals is not okay. Period. This is not about me. I am not wrong for caring about whether my baby is crying. This is about you not paying attention to our baby and then trying to make me the bad guy for being upset that you left the baby lying in the shit-filled diaper and wailing for help. For too long. Story 3. So I male have four daughters all under 10, and I am admittedly a bit on edge with any comments related to gender norms, stereotypes women, and the like. This past weekend, we went to a friend of ours kid's birthday party. My other friend called John that I haven't seen in years. His wife and three sons were there. I haven't seen him since he started having kids, and his kids are all under 10 as well. A bit of background on John. He's always been a jerk to women in high school, college. He just always treated them more as objects. His mom was a stay-at-home mom, and he's always been of the opinion that a woman's places in the home shouldn't work and should take care of her family and men, while the man should be in charge of the finances and decisions. Of course, his wife is stay-at-home. Not that there's anything wrong with stay-at-home parents. It's a tough job. But I think the belief that women are required to stay at home is appalling. In any event, since he has three sons and I have four daughters, and knowing how he is, I was ready for some annoying comments. Sure enough, he started right out of the gate. Stuff like, oh, four daughters, that's rough. Got to keep trying for the boy. I've got my sons to carry on the family name. Hope you have a good place to hide when the bloodbaths start, etc. My wife was proud of me. She knows comments like these annoy me as I just brush them off. Responses like, yeah, it's all good. So here's where I may be a-hole. Towards the end of the party, he said in front of two of my girls and two of his sons, good thing you made my boys a bunch of girls. Maybe they'll get married someday and carry on the... John's last name. Name. My response was less than stellar. Well, your sons aren't really good enough for my girls. I've since looked up comebacks online and wish I went with something better. Like, if I wanted to hear from an A.H., I thought I said it straight-faced. And he just said, guess you're sensitive like your girls and walked away. Unfortunately, that was not the end of it. John told his wife and she posted on Facebook my name and tag. Me doesn't think my songs are good enough for his daughters. What an AH I haven't responded and don't plan to. I have three siblings, two brothers and a sister. And interestingly, my brother said they would have said worse. My sister thinks I'm the AH because I insulted the kids, which was not the intent, but technically true. So now I'm wondering if I am indeed the AH. On the other hand, no one gets away with saying anything demeaning or misogynistic around my family, at least if there's anything I can do about it. My wife said I was doing so good and should have just went out on a high note. What say you? Now for the comments. NTA. 
For me, it is immensely important that you clap back. It was in front of your daughters. Doesn't matter which two. Doesn't matter how old they are. They need to see that Joan's attitude is not acceptable and that their father disagrees with that ideology. If you had allowed him to speak about your daughters, that way as though that property and chattel good for nothing else than making babies to carry on someone else's family line, then they would believe, however, second joyously, that you believe that way too. Confidence starts with your parents. You drew a line for all of your girls. This is not good enough for you. You deserve better. You deserve people in your life who don't place value on you based on your gender. I applaud you, sir. NTA, you made a mess of this, but I am letting you off the hook for that because you were trying to say something very important, just doing a bad job at it. And I doubt the under 10-year-old kids understood or cared. Really? But it's not what you meant. And it doesn't feel good to cede the moral high ground to the idiot mom blasting bickering nonsense on social media. Still, you were provoked the whole time, but consider different strategies next time. Not just burns from the internet, but when someone is doing something out of bounds, I name it immediately, and you don't have to make a big deal about it. Sometimes it's get your hands off my ass behind the copier, Frank, or some people keep their family name after they marry. Some change it. My daughters will choose appropriately, and I'm sure your kids will do as well. I think you let things bottle up. Of course, you don't want to start a fight at a social function, but pushing back does not require that. So when he says you got to get a boy, blah, 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 look him dead in the eyes and say, I'm happy with my family the way it's currently composed. End of discussion.